So our first speaker is Andrew Fitzgibbon, and his talk is going to be AI hardware and real world AI. So over to Andrew. Thank you very much. Um, very pleased to be here. Uh, it's, it's one of my favorite conferences. Um, okay, so I'm going to begin with uh, the take home messages that I want you to take home from this talk. But actually, what's much more important is the don't take home messages. Uh, these are uh, cliches that all of us hear all of the time. Like many cliches, sometimes they're true, but remember that they can be false. So for many, many years, we've told each other, we've reassured each other that compute is cheap and that we can use as much of it as we like. And that programmer time is the most important thing and not compute time. So uh, I'm going to say um, sometimes compute is not cheap. And essentially, this talk is about optimizing code. It's about being obsessed with writing fast and efficient code. So if you don't like that sort of thing, then listen to this talk, and maybe you will at the end. If you do like that sort of thing, you're definitely in the right place. Um, there's another thing that snooty computer scientists um, say to uh, grubby engineers like me when I talk about making the code faster. And the snooty computer scientists say, speed is not important, correctness is important. I claim that most security bugs are a result of people trying to make their code go faster. Right? Why didn't you stirlend the two strings before you malloced enough memory to hold the concatenation and then free it? You didn't do that because, gosh, that sounds really, really slow. So actually, I'm cl claiming speed is the only thing. Correctness, you, you can always get correctness, just write deeply inefficient code. Um, we have slowly persuaded ourselves that if you've got a box and it says one gigaflop or one teraflop or one petaflop, that you can't really get those numbers in practice. And I'm going to claim that, yes, sometimes you can. Yes, it's hard work. You can get peak flops. And it's worth thinking about it. It's worth asking yourself, why do I not have peak flops on this problem? I'm going to try and argue for that. Um, something I'm obsessed with is uh, I don't like machines with nonsense in them. Nonsense equals uh, caches, branch predictors, speculative execution, any of that nonsense that Chip designers have been forced to put in their chips for 60 years because we, the compiler people, have been assuring them that it'll be fine and it's never fine. So why do machines have loads of festoonery? It's because compiler people haven't supplied the right tools. And yet I'm going to claim that now is the time for that to change and it has already changed, basically because machine learning models are so incredibly simple. Um, so I'll, show, I'll kind of go through that. Um, and of course, um, the most important thing not to take home is that there is any silver bullet or, or you know, single answer to any question. So as I said, none of these are, uh, every one of these has exceptions and, and get out clauses. Um, one maybe take home message that I've got from the language Julia, even though I kind of do it only for hobby work at the moment, not saying it's not good for loads of stuff, it's just that I've happened to end up that way, um, is this idea of it's just code. So big, complicated machine learning models, when you convert them into code, I think they become very simple, and I'll try and show that. Um, I'll give you a little bit of my CV. Why, am I, you know, why do I think I'm uh, the person to talk about this? Um, so I grew up in Ireland. I had a brilliant job in the summer as a water taxi driver on a boat like this, which was incredibly busy from 7 a.m. to 11 a.m., and then incredibly busy from 4 p.m. to 7 p.m., um, which left a solid amount of time for scribbling uh, computer programs on pieces of paper that I could type into my ZX Spectrum uh, later. So that's how uh, I got into sort of programming and maths. Uh, I went to Edinburgh to do a master's. Uh, that was great. And then I thought there's no way I'm going to do a PhD. That seems like an awful lot of time to produce, you know, quite, quite a scary book. Uh, so I got a job as an RSE. Um, but was sort of lucky enough that after seven years of RSE, I'd accidentally contributed to enough stuff. That, um, that I got a PhD, so that was kind of best of both worlds. Um, and then I've done a lot of work on, on 3D vision until about five years ago when I just got really interested in uh, compilers, programming languages, programming models. So I'm kind of like a freshly minted compiler PhD now. I've got a couple of publications in, uh, in compiler places, uh, so I'm super excited. I have the zeal of the fresh PhD. Um, I did a lot of that work at, um, <clears throat> I'll, I'll talk a little bit now about the work I did at Microsoft, which is again about hyper-efficient um, gradient descent, and then, um, and then how that applies to what I'm doing now at GraphCore. Um, so um, a piece of work that kind of the, pre, the piece of work I did really before GraphCore was to um, build a system which could uh, track the human hand by looking at the human hand through a connect camera, like a depth camera, so you can see the camera at the bottom of the uh, TV there. 
and uh, if you could track the human hand and all its fingers, a sort of you know video rate at high at fine detail, then you could build you know cool user interfaces like this. I thought it was going to be super important to uh, make that slider wafer thin, so you would get a haptic feel from it. Turns out it's not at all. The wafer thinness isn't what matters. It's the point when your finger touches the slider. The visual feedback is what makes it feel good. Uh, that was a real question, like, was this ever going to work? Um, we did that on a, our first implementation. This was on a pair of GPUs, so it was about 400 watts, I think, in those days, maybe 700 watts. Um, we needed to run it on this device, which is uh, basically uh, something called the HoloLens, which has basically got a decent PC, you know, sort of consumer PC, consumer GPU, none of which you're allowed to use to do any computer vision because the consumers need them. Um, so that's a machine with a, a fantastic 24 core, 500 megahertz, um, you know, sort of DSP chip. Uh, so it has about four gigaflops in total. And what we tried to do, what we had to do was take this gradient descent code that ran on 700 watts on a GPU and make it run in a few hundred milliwatts on this, uh, on this device. Um, we were pretty proud of our research code or GPU code before we started this. You know, we thought we were about 10x faster than everyone else. But that was the olden days when we didn't realize just how much inefficiency we leave lying around in what we think is fast code today, even if it's in C++. Um, it was quite fun trying to make it go fast on two 500 megahertz machines. Um, of course, there's a whole research side where we actually did better algorithms. We changed what we were doing. There's a whole chunk of stuff where we just changed iteration counters from 20s to 2s and stuff, and it kept working. But also, we just really had to optimize the code, getting optimal flops for the inner loop, which is just, you know, it's, it's the only time I've actually done it. So, but it's so good when the machine is just melting. Um, and um, in the world of Race to Idle, which some of you will know about, what you want is the machine to be melting for a millisecond and then quiet for 999 milliseconds. Um, uh, handwritten gradients, I'm going to show you how that's not scary at all. And we're going to do some handwritten gradients here. Um, and on this machine, as the same as if you've got, you know, 40 gigabytes of RAM um, on a bunch of GPUs, you actually need to know where each matrix is living. So you basically end up with whiteboard malloc even today in 40 gigabytes or even then in 256 kilobytes. Whiteboard malloc literally means there's a whiteboard in the office. And if you want some space in memory, you mark it out. And if somebody else is already sitting there, you go to them, you have discussion about, uh, about um, you know, when they need that. And then if you're out of memory, you ship it off to DRAM, which takes unbelievably, you know, tens of microseconds. Um, and then you ship it back later. And it's just, it's actually fun to code and it's not that hard. That's what I want to really convey at the end of this. Uh, oh yeah, so this is just showing us, you know, moving over two years of optimization um, from two iterations to second, per second to 512, which was, what we needed to, to ship the thing. So that's two years of a team of, I guess, you know, four to 10 people, depending how you count it, just working hard on code. So we would like to make that easier. For this, it was absolutely important because the thing is running on your head. It cannot go hot. If it goes too hot, it turns off. So um, you, you need to make it optimal. Um, a good thing to do when you're doing a speed up, sometimes you have to make changes to your model. Sometimes you have to make the actual algorithm worse. So we have this sort of classic graph, which is, this is one year of this work from January to, so um, in this direction, um, we're talking about how long it takes to run. And in this direction, it's how accurate it is. So you can see that, you know, sometime early in January, we made it faster, but less accurate. Then we had some invention that made it more accurate at the same speed. You know, sometime down here, we made it um, less accurate and not faster. Um, <laughs> But we knew that that was because at the end of all that work, we'd get down to here and it would be, it'd be better. Um, the best thing about a 2D graph like this is that you can show it to senior management and they have no idea what's going on. So they don't stop you for that month when it's less accurate and slower. Um, that's, a, that's a key strategy. Um, okay, so that's fine. That's just a, an example of a small classic computer vision model. It was doing gradient descent at every iteration of a, of a you know, 500 parameter model. Let's bring that to the modern world where we have machine learning models. And I'll show you a, a very small machine learning model here. And then we'll talk about bigger and bigger models and how these ideas, um, how these ideas uh, pertain. So it's very common to draw a machine learning model using the diagram on the left. I find that deeply confusing. There are many, many, implement uh, many, many interpretations I could make of the diagram on the left. I find that a diagram on the right 
Is that, is that moving? Yes. Um, much more helpful, right? The diagram on the right, on the right says there are four, uh, you know, unpack your input parameters into, uh, you know, some matrices. It doesn't tell you they're matrices uh, because I'm in a language without type annotations, but, you know, watch the bare type space if you're a Python person. It's all getting very exciting. Um, and then I'm going to do mm, which I know is matmol, and I'm going to add, and I'm going to do a relu, and I'm going to mm, and then add. So, you know, we can actually express these models, I think, better often just as writing code. This isn't pseudocode, this is running Python. Um, and, and it, you know, sort of exactly describes what's going on. If you do care about the numbers here, then you have to look at the initialization code, and we'll look at that a little bit later. But this is the, the body of the code that I want to run. Now, of course, that's not the code I want to run, right? That's just the so-called forward model. So now I'm going to show you a big scary slide and it's all going to be fine. Um, okay, so we're going to spend a while on this so you don't need to rush to read it. So what have I got here? I've got the code, the model, the machine learning model. It fits in the top left-hand corner of the slide. The thing that we're actually going to be running in our inner loop all the time, we're going to be computing a loss of the model. Now, I've stripped out a huge amount of sort of ancillary stuff here, but nevertheless, this represents the essential compute that these, these models are doing. What I want to do is call this loss many times. So what does the loss do? It takes the parameters W, it takes the input image X, it takes the ground truth label L. These are just, you know, that's just an integer. Forget about batches for the moment. We'll get to that later. Uh, passes the parameters and the image through the feed forward model, does some matmol, relu, matmol, blah, blah spits out 10 numbers and then looks up the ground truth entry, entry in that list and, you know, computes its negative log. Okay, so that's the code that's running inside the optimization loop of your machine learning model. Oh, sorry. Um, so I'm just going to inline that code a bit because uh, loss, you know, I really want to just line up in one place all the computations that happen. So all I've done is I've inlined FFN into loss and we can see the essential function there. I've also really made explicit that this plus is another function that we call, so it's matmol add, et cetera, et cetera, right? So we're being very explicit, very sort of low level, but still Python. I can still single step through this, I can debug it, it's really easy. This is the bit that's magic, or not magic, because you're going to do it by hand. What does PyTorch do, or what does TensorFlow do with your model? Well, the easiest way to answer all these questions is to go to Jax. Um, so you'll see, I, I've kind of kept this in pseudocode level, but you'll see traces of Jax everywhere, so just go there. Um, uh, what does it do when you run a model like this? PyTorch in particular kind of remembers that I ran a matmol so that later, sometime later, I can run a function called mmvjp, right, or mm reverse derivative. So it's actually super easy. I mean, that's super easy. It's painful. And of course, there are tools to do it for you. But I think it's very instructional to take my model and just write down the reverse derivative, right? So all I'm doing is taking each line here, applying this rule. If function takes ABC and returns PQ, then it's going to take in, its reverse derivative is going to take in PQ and return ABC. Now, this is super inefficient, right? Because I'm re probably inside softmax VJP, I'm recomputing what happened in softmax. That's fine for the moment. This is just so we can understand the code. And remember, this is literally Python code that I can literally run and I can write unit tests to check that it does the same as the automatic grads, and then I can really get to optimize it. So this is the bit that I want to get to. I've tried this many times. Um, no, it's just not happy today. OK, we're going to do it this way, right? So slightly older code. So what am I going to do? I'm going to take grad loss matmol, right? So, uh, uh, apologies, I can't operate my machine, but um, this is a slightly older version of the same talk, same ideas. I'm just inlining a bunch of code, right? So this was log VJP of Z. So all I'm doing is just inlining a bunch of code that I know. One hot is an inefficient function. We can tell that, right? Because it produces a large vector, mostly zeros, um, with one entry being a one. Don't immediately think, oh, I'll use a sparse matrix package for that, for two reasons. Number one, a lot of these things sparse, start sparse and end up full. And if there's anything worse than a full matrix, it's a sparse full matrix. Um, um, and number two, um, you know, there may be other ways to optimize it. Don't let's, uh, don't let's just run straight for the runtime implementation of going fast, which is what a sparse matrix package is. So uh, I'm looking at optimization opportunities. One hot, that's definitely going to have to go away. I'm going to inline this DZ into all sorts of places. That should improve things. Um, this is kind of annoying. I've got two vectors here. I'm not saying you can tell that they're vectors, but I would be single stepping and mousing over them. Uh, so live, it would tell me that there are two vectors. I'm not, I'm not clever enough to just see it. 
Um, outer product, that's bad, right? Two metrics, vectors are going to turn into a matrix. Anyway, let's blast away, right? So there's a bits, of, bits of code that we can optimize. Oh, there's another thing here that some of these values, like Q1, it has to last for the whole run of the function. This is a two-layer network. If it were a 50-layer network, Q1 is going to last for 50, you know, it's going to last a long time. But it's all just code, right? That's my point. Um, um, so I'll, I'll zoom through it. Uh, look, I got rid of the one hot because I did some other stuff. Um, my outer product is here, and it has to be here because this is a return value from my function. The contract of my function says I have to return this matrix. Yes, I could make a little runtime wrapper that remembers it's an outer product, right? Okay, but again, I'm depending on runtime stuff. Why should I? Um, so what I'm going to do now is instead I'm going to actually take in the existing parameters, um, some information I'm not going to tell you about, and I'm going to return the updated parameters. So I'm changing the contract of my function. I'm breaking a level of abstraction, right? I'm moving out into the optimizer loop and saying, hey, you know, we need this to go fast. I'm out in the optimizer loop. And now I'm going to do the adding for you. And uh, happy surprise, adding an outer product is super cheap. So I just saved loads of memory, right? I just saved n squared chunk of memory that could well have been the difference between 39 gig and 42 gig, and 42 gig is bad and 39 is good. Um, right, OK, I said I would finish in a minute, so I'd better do that. Um, uh, uh, this, uh, you'll find a link, I'll send you a link later. This is the so-called transformer model in the rendering that I find by far the easiest to understand. So. Uh, Take your input integers, look up the embeddings, add some positional encodings, uh, do a linear thing, then do a self-attention thing, do that lots of times for lots of heads, spit out the answer. Now, I'm not saying you can read the whole transformer in 25 lines of code right here, but I, it's so helpful, I find, to go back to this when I wonder what bit is where, what does pre-attention mean, what does pre-normalization mean? It just means turning on and off individual lines of code. I'll skip that. Um, I'll talk a little bit about um, GraphCore, where I work now. So this is the HoloLens chip that I worked on before. Um, why is it efficient? You keep your arithmetic very close to your memory. You don't mess around with nonsense. And you have to help the compiler. So the, this was a 10 silica um, compiler with uh, two and a half wide instruction words. It did a great job of packing the instruction words. It couldn't do the high level optimizations. We did the low. In a sense, one of the reasons I love the GraphCore chip is that really, it's just 1,500 completely insane processors. So 1,500 300 gigaflop processors. Remember, I was running on a 3 gigaflop processor on the HoloLens. 1,500 of those on the same chip, 9,000 threads of control, 9,000 different if statement branches can be running on the machine at the same time. That's the key difference to something like a GPU. Every one of these threads can be doing a different thing at the same time and still running at full speed. That's a nice machine. Um, again, same thing I said before. And let me just very quickly, so how do you program the IPU? Um, and you know, you go to GraphCore and you say, how do I program IPU? Um, three levels. You can do it at C++ down there on the tiles. If, if that excites you, great, you know, do it because obviously that's the way to get optimal performance for unusual applications. Um, you can do it at a slightly higher level where you talk to our graph compiler, give it a tensor program, and we will split the tensors across the tiles for you. Or, of course, you can go up to um, TensorFlow, PyTorch, etc. Um, it works well for lots and lots of different compute. We keep calling it classic deep learning now. We mean post-2012, so then what you call general machine learning, etc. Stuff that runs well on GPUs runs well on the IPU because it's got a load of MATMOLs, and GPUs do a load of MATMOLs, so that's fine. But that's not the fun part. The fun part is what I call modern deep learning i.e. mixture of experts, um, you know, uh, graph neural networks. So, for example, uh, Michael Bronstein, who's a, you know, renowned graph neural network person, um, suddenly, get, you know, gets 10x over um, GPUs, over high-end GPUs using the IPU. Why? Because graph networks are lots and lots of tiny, or, you know, small-ish networks all doing different things. Um, it's really fast to do this on this kind of hardware. Um, if you want to do Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, then really, most people just can't make it run on the GPU. You can, but it's a nightmare. So most people don't. So we're comparing against CPUs because it's easy to port that code to the I CPU code to the IPU. So then again, you get a, bit, a big advantage. Um, and my favorite workload, using the thing that's called GraphCore to do graphics, which is kind of like using an A100 to do graphics, right? They're not, graphics card are not designed to do graphics, uh, particularly not to do ray tracing um, other than built-in specialized hardware. So a really messy workload is ray tracing, and that runs nicely on the machine. 
Okay, um, so there, here are my take home messages. Um, let's, you know, think about writing more efficient code. It's great fun. And today I believe you can persuade your, your uh, bosses and funders that it's, it's worthwhile. Um, I, there is this concept of Olympic class programmers. Um, you know, we know they exist just as they're Olympic class runners. That's great. But maybe we can build tools where we can all get to being Olympic class runners, just as I can, you know, ski on Bodie Miller's skis or ride on Chris Boardman's bike. Um, you know, I want to get us to a world where we're all just writing this crazy fast code. Uh, I'm not claiming I'm an Olympic class programmer, but I've worked with them. Um, and uh, you can try the IPU on Paperspace if uh, it sounds exciting. Thank you. Amazing time to talk ever. That was 23 seconds over. Oh, gosh. I'll, I'll try it again. And so I think we should be able to get side up. Uh, Are you okay to... Yes, yes. So question, do you have any numbers on how much less power an IPU is compared to an equivalent GPU? When they're running at full, uh, at full speed, they're using around the same. But if, you run it, if your model runs 10x faster, then that's 10x less power. So that's, it's, it's kind of the race to idle idea. Get your work done faster, but it's actually, the powers are very equivalent at the moment. Uh, what are your views on automated code optimization? Um, absolutely, it will happen. Um, I've, you know, I've looked at it myself um, occasionally, um, tried it in different ways. It will happen. AlphaGo tells us that we will be able to do automated code optimization. But when I looked at it, um, a mistake I made was I was kind of looking at little C plus, you know, little C plus plus routines, little kernels. I hadn't done the work I'd done here to just kind of persuade myself that code transformations in Python are actually reasonable and difficult to do right. So, uh, yeah, now I'm now I have more hope now that I've written this talk in the last six months uh, that we can we can do it in the automated um, way. Is graph code something that you can buy? Oh yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So GraphCore is on the Mark II chip, um, so it's the second uh, version of the chip. And yeah, you can absolutely you can try it out on the cloud. Um, put that back. Um, you can try it out on the cloud, or you can you know rent full time on the cloud. Yeah, no, we're very much encouraging people to use it. Especially for me, I especially like it if you're doing you know wacky applications, right? You know, uh, sort of classical vision or any of those things. Uh, yeah, sure. Olympic class programmers do it. Yeah, right. Uh, you know, there's a sense where Olympic class programmers, I think, I think one of the reasons I wanted to do compilers is because that seems to be, you know, where the Olympic class programmers hang out. So, you know, if I hang out there, maybe, you know, maybe it'll rub off. Um, so, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, uh, there's the one there, that, but your hand was up before that arrived, I believe. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, I was just going to ask, um, when you writing C++ code, for example, um, often it's the case that the, the compiler does all the clever stuff, so you don't often have to think about how I optimize it. Um, whereas uh, what you're doing with the GPU and the IPU, I imagine you have to think quite a lot about how I optimize for this. Uh, do you think we'll get to a stage where it will be done in the background? I hopefully, but I think we shouldn't be afraid of writing it ourselves first. And the more we write it ourselves, the more we'll know what we want. And I would say a lot of the optimizations, like that one hot optimization, compiler might spot it, probably won't, probably not allowed. Anything where you reorder a floating point computation, compiler's not allowed to reorder it. So a lot of, yeah, I should say, the back end of TensorFlow, JAX, et cetera, they do a lot of these transformations. They do a great job. but. It's really useful for us to know which ones they're failing to do. Um, so, a bit of a blurry answer, but yeah. If you could join me in thanking Andrew again. Thank you all.